How to overcome overwhelming emotions, emotional budgeting technique. Interview with Dr. Paul Sambataro. Are you a parent with children, especially young adults? Then you are not new to emotions that often become overwhelming. Are there ways that you can learn and teach your kids to overcome and manage these emotions? Yes, there are. And if you want to learn, then you're in the right place. Our guest today is going to share the technique called emotional budgeting that can help improve emotion regulation and increase the feeling of self-control and problem-solving competency. So stay tuned. Welcome to Happy and Healthy Mind program, episode 130. Today, our guest is Dr. Paul Sambataro. He's the developer of the Emotional Budgeting Workbook course. He's the president of Houston Behavioral Health Institute. Dr. Paul has doctorate in neurobehavioral psychology, and he completed his clinical and organizational psychology studies with a background in wildlife biology, and he's also a retired school psychologist. So thank you, Dr. Paul, for joining us today. Thank you. I'm really grateful to be here. Wonderful. And I'm your host, Dr. Rosina Lakani. I help leaders eliminate burnout. You see, I've been helping people overcome severe depression and anxiety over the last 26 years as an MD psychiatrist. And I realize that the root cause of many of the mental and physical illnesses is chronic stress. And therefore, in this program, we share tips for mental fitness so you could eliminate stress-induced burnout, develop mental resilience, and prevent illnesses so you can live your best life with hope, health, and happiness. This program is for educational purposes only. So if you want any specific medical advice, please consult your healthcare professional. All right, so let's jump in. So Dr. Paul, tell me why and how did this topic become become important in your life? Thank you. This is really wasn't on my radar growing up or being a part as a young adult or even as a becoming a dad uh, with young children at the time. It's pretty amazing how ignorant I really was of this whole mental health. Now, of course, it was a few years ago, you can tell, and there was the internet was just starting and Google was the browsers were just starting in the nineties. And so before that, there wasn't a whole lot that was shared as a part of the community with my understanding in the background, even though I was familiar with counseling and, and so forth, but as technology advanced and as we kind of learned to listen to the articulation of what constituted a behavior that was a problem. So that, turned into mental health issues as we understood it. And actually, thankfully, because now we can think about behaviors that are really destructive or harmful as not necessarily being a person's character. And that really was before we always thought about someone's behavior as a part of character. And for me, I always assumed that our culture or our background or our family or our situation was the driving force of our behaviors and yes there are influences but as my children grew older there were things that just the picture didn't always fit there were counselors and then there were psychologists and then there were psychiatrists but as a dad there seemed to be an areas where when our children were in trouble or there were issues, it just seemed that there were gaps. And I strive from that point on going to school, going to university through education, uh, many, many years working to figure out what picture was missing from this whole issue and what was effective because through the university, it was difficult to think about efficacy, what was effective. And in doing that, that's how this topic really kind of took light, looking for and working on through a clinic we had in Washington State, through now, through our, to find something and to develop something that was actually specifically filling in that gap and something that I consider missing, but also through understanding the results and how they have improved the efficacy overall of these 
other areas. So thank you for sharing that. You know, the the why behind the work is so important. And it kind of gives you that passion, that that fire, because you went through that and you kind of felt it. So can you share a story of someone that you helped and how their life was before and after they applied these tools that you're sharing, how their life changed after? Sure. And again, we had a clinic back. We had several clinics, but our last clinic that we left in Washington is in the Kitsap area. And we have a couple examples. And now that it's been a while, I'm not going to, you know, of course, share any names and all of that. So these are just case. These are real case issues that did occur. We had a gentleman that came in about 55 years old. He was looking, he, he, he actually announced that he was looking for a lifetime counselor. And immediately his issues were not what we would say, you know, something that would run to a hospital or any of those, but they were detrimental to his function. In other words, his life. And he was really upset. He was depressed because he knew there was something going on. He just didn't know. So he was asking for a lifetime counselor, to, of course, to do this. And at that point, never in my interest to think of ourselves as lifetime counselors. We think of ourselves, if we have an issue that we cannot work with or help someone and within a period of time, then I think it's incumbent upon us to ask for additional maybe help or expertise, someone else who might better have some understanding of the situation. But in this case, we applied those things around him and he did have, it was, it's not a simple case because as it turned out, he didn't realize, but he had autistic symptoms, the spectrum issues. We don't necessarily have to call those people autistic, but they have the similar symptoms. And that was, uh, he didn't really understand how that was impacting him, his brain development in that area. So he had gone on a self-medication, which pretty typical. He went to doing the off-the-counter drugs that are available. He also had issues with relationship and he didn't know why. So he, those autistic spectrums, which were a little more intense, but not enough. To, he, could, he was functional to work, but it interfered with his relationship. Mm -hmm. So he would be so not only emotion regulation problem, but because of that, it was affecting his relationships. Absolutely. So he would become overwhelmed at a point, some point in the relationship, like three or four days in or where it was overwhelming and he would shut down and then it would be a problem. And then it would start all over again because he would process and then it was clear. And then he would, the emotions, the information of that emotional engagement mm -hmm. would crowd his thinking, his processing. He would become overwhelmed. He would shut down. So this was a cycle. He was going through at a very consistent way. You, mm -hmm. you helped him and with some of the tools, and I'm really excited to learn those things. So once you helped him, how did his life change? He absolutely, well, he just came in one day. It was after 12 or so weeks, and he just came in and said, and we had gone through the process of explaining also with his relationship person, his, uh, at that time it was his girlfriend, but we explained. He wanted us to explain to her as well what was going on with him, which is sometimes unusual. People don't, they get embarrassed or, and she understood. So all of a sudden there was this perspective and awareness they both suddenly had, and it was no longer a part of their character flaws or it, somebody was at fault. They, and he just said, he called up and he said, you know, I don't, I don't need to come in anymore. Uh, everything's going great and we understand. And that was that. Wonderful. So that's how fast it happens when there's that awareness mm -hmm. and just that, that clarity of the issue as well as, you know, the, the additional things. Mm -hmm. There's one other example that I would just real quick, because it had to do with the family that I'm, you know, is, is hurtful is when they're, you have an extended family. It happens a lot here in the States. And we had a daughter, a dad, ex-wife, and a stepmother, and another sister or originally. So you have this, you can have this, you know, it doesn't always happen. Things go smoothly. And when they don't, people escalate and results in a lot of issues that are, you know, impact everybody. And again, what was interesting and what I like to is that when applying these things and talking about and making sure that 
they have this opening up of this awareness of the relationships. It actually works so well in the mind that they don't actually have to understand the science behind it. There's no, you know, it's not a science project. It's the brain under picks it up. By doing that, it, it does the work that we think we have to do consciously. It unconsciously does the work so that when it comes back and there's a feedback, there was a lot of de-escalation all around for the family. That's, and that was really impactful in a positive way and helpful to see that for me because it was so part of the unconscious mind at work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it would make more sense as you go into some of the details of the the techniques that help this family. But I guess like, you know, that family came in in distraught and then they were able to build better relationship afterwards. Absolutely. Because as anybody knows with a daughter or son, if the daughter, if we, we can, with any of us, we escalate because there's a flood of information coming from 10 years or, and it, it's all the way the memory works is connected. So it's not as if we stop mm -hmm. the, the flow, it flows in and then we process mm -hmm. and differentiate and try to problem solve. But when it's all in the brain, and depending on the ability of the person, it can escalate the physiology of a, an individual faster than they're able to process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so that's really nice to see when everything is working and the brain is working the uh -huh. way you expect a liver and a heart to function. You get that excitement because you see the person reacting the way that they want to mm -hmm. rather than mm -hmm. the body is telling it to. So I'm getting excited to learn this technique. So please share. We don't have 12 weeks to learn, but can you share something in 12 minutes that our audience could benefit from? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not, you know, it's a, it's a lot. And again, I have a course that's 100 pages because in the workbook, I actually have a workbook on Amazon, but the problem was we didn't really flesh it out. We, we said, here's how, what it is. And if you do this, it works. And it's, it's, people really need to better understand. And when we get a chance, we'll also put those hundred pages, but it's a hundred pages of step by step explanation. And the whole reason it was called emotional budgeting. And this is where I try to, I made that name. The mistake is sometimes people think of emotional spending, like it's an emotional catch that we divide up. And that's as far from the truth of what I consider emotional budgeting, because when we go to personal finance and personal finance can do a lot of similar same things because it takes the anxiety out when the mind is organized it's structure we provide structure for the memory we provide structure for the brain itself not just our conscious mind but the brain so when we go like, so like yes. in financial terms you kind of spend money or you earn money but when you're budgeting you're kind of planning okay you may have this much amount of money and you can spend here and here. So, so once you have that kind of budgeting, your anxiety goes down a little and you have more organization and financial terms. And you are saying the same thing happens with emotions. Exactly. But I would term it just a little bit differently okay, because please. I would consider the line item budget. And that's something that, uh, because, it's not just knowing revenue in and your spending total, because when, if you can imagine, I always bring this example up between a wife and a husband, uh -huh. you're going along in the month and all of a sudden somewhere $500 goes out, but that can be pretty detrimental to a family. And all of a sudden it's, it causes a lot of problems. And if nobody knows where that happened, the escalation, because the body is reacting to the stress and before you can think, Everyone is getting riled up and blaming and faulting. But once, if there's a budget and you go line by line where the spending happened and you see where it happened and you know how it happened, then you can plan for the next month or plan how to, you know, think of ways to solve that deficit or issue that caught everyone by surprise. Makes sense. And actually emotions happen that way all the time. We're caught off guard all the time, uh, especially... But it's a little more than just getting caught off guard. There's the processing and the memory, which going to the processing center. And it's the ability of the person who we don't know that ability unless 
we see that they've been identified as autistic or maybe they have some other issue or a cognitive issue that's actually been assessed. But if they haven't been assessed, we make a lot of assumptions. We actually, as parents, make assumptions all the time because we're, we don't, first, we don't have time. We're busy trying to work. And then we're saying, do this and do that. Make sure you don't mess up here and don't cause trouble there. But if something goes wrong, all of a sudden it messes everything up and everyone starts to kind of make assumptions and rely on old hundred year thoughts of patterns of why we are doing our behaviors. When in fact, if we had assessments, we actually know, and this comes from me being a school psychologist, of course, because they're so important to understand the differences between each person's brain. There's a lot of difference mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in the abilities that they have. So some have great processing abilities. Some have great auditory memory. Some have great visual memory. But it's kind of rare to have great everything all at the same package. You might have an even everything, which, but that doesn't mean it's always. And actually, when there's too much difference between one part of the brain and the other, that also causes a lot of problems and angst for the individual who's trying to understand themselves. Mm -hmm. so, so let's see if like, okay, let's see my example. Okay. I have a teen, you know, I have a 15 year old kid and, you know, they got, go, go through different emotional issues as, as the stress of uh, school comes or extracurricular or friends or stuff like that. So, so tell me in more practical way, when I see my kid, having some emotional, overwhelming emotions, what should I say, do specifically in that situation so I can help them apply this emotional budgeting technique or how, and, and help them overcome these overwhelming emotions? Well, one of the most important things too for processing and emotions is not getting caught off guard and being prepared. So everything we do in life that we do better is being prepared, whether you're an EMT, policeman, uh, the more prepared we are, the better we are. So the emotional budgeting is being prepared. Same as when you go in and do finances. If you are prepared before you spend your money and you know where your money is coming from and what your immediate expenses are, which a lot of people do, but they take it for granted. If you know that, you're prepared to go to the store and say, I can only spend $10 or $20 or $100. Yeah. And I won't go to the movie theater because I need this money for something else. Yeah. And being prepared means your anxiety, you're in control. The person's in control. So that's so like walk me through more practically. Okay. So when we do it's about relations. So when we practice to have an understanding of line item how a person your child with you and you with your child, so there's two different perspectives with a line item of that relationship. When you do something good, there's a behavior. When that child does something wrong, there's a behavior. And when you write it down, both the young person and parent, they can see when a situa what the situation arises. Good things and maybe some things that are not so good. But by writing them down, immediately becomes clear what happens and what are the behaviors and what are the consequences so now when that happens it clarifies the processing and memory already for that person so it's like putting it to bed you, you you've clarified that relationship so that when an incident happens when the memory is flooded back with the data or the memory that is associated, it may even include more things that are at the level of intensity. So the greater the intensity, the more of those things are going to be attached to that memory coming back into the processing center. So you mean the memory of something bad happening in past or some argument that happened or? Well, ironically, what I've seen, I know we, we think of things that are bad hooked together, but actually it's the intensity of the emotion. So I've actually seen what I would consider, and I, I'm not speaking totally science, but from the experience, even good things that are high intensity will drag bad things with high intensity if it's a similar intensity back into processing. Yeah, it would really help to have a, a specific example. 
So can you give a specific example of maybe sure. a client or your child or where this, the, you saw this thing and then you were able to solve it so that our audience can actually apply this technique? So a lot of times when children are excited, so they have a birthday mm -hmm. and it's very exciting. It leads up to it. So they're, they're thinking about the birthday and it, it's exciting. Children with issues, not, not everybody. So a lot of times, uh, so many children and families are different. But with a child that may have issues with things that are anxiety or um, depression or things that are trauma-based, a good thought or a happy moment when it's not during the moment but right afterwards, a lot of times the memory is associated with also will drag into the processing center the things that are high intensity but may not be good. Okay. And if, uh, explain to me what is high intensity what is this processing because a lot of our audience may not understand what is high intensity that you're referring to so like a birthday event or christmas something yeah. that so so, so okay, you're talking about let's say a kid a 15 year old kid oh, mm -hmm. that that is getting excited about the birthday coming okay mm -hmm. or christmas and, or christmas coming okay so then what what overwhelms like what causes the overwhelming of that emotion well that goes in there but it's what happens if it, in during those events other things can come back into the processing center so if we kind of compartmentalize the processing center away from other parts of the brain there are so many different parts of the brain and i i'm trying to make it so but processing usually we understand now Trust me, we really didn't articulate any of this decades ago. But yeah. now processing works. Part of the brain that kind of receives the, uh, receives, receives the information and processes what is right, what is not right, what is good, what is not good type of thing when you say that kind of thing. And also maybe we can just say conscious part of the brain. So with yeah. rational thinking or any of that, where we're trying to think if we have to problem solve in 10 seconds some issue, and you know, some people might be able to do it fast. Some people might struggle. I consider that the processing center that I'm trying to share with the audience, that area where we're, we have a problem or an issue or some event, and we know it's happening. We're aware of it. We're conscious. And we're trying to either problem solve or just reflect on what's happening. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times the issue that I'm referring to is that we don't, always control what comes into the processing center so that's not the conscious part the conscious part isn't we don't control a gate that says we only allow this information into the processing center so it makes it easy for us what makes it complicated is because it dumps it dumps a lot of things and sometimes so let's say this kid is planning a, a birthday party okay and they are they're in the birthday party or they they're going through that and then suddenly electricity goes away or their cake doesn't arrive or a friend says something and then exactly. they become relationship they become exactly. now exactly. You know, they start either crying or screaming or they kind of start losing their control so so that is emotional overwhelm they got emotionally overwhelmed it may be the simple trigger like you know losing the electricity or or their the get the gift that they were expecting or the cake that they were going to cut it didn't come out right and then they are start they start either crying or how do people react when they feel overwhelmed like what do what have you seen kids behaving i'm just kind of seeing from well, and else. that's interesting that starts a whole another topic for me but i'm going to try and articulate this as well as i can because the physiology of a person is so important to what happens now in the brain it may be the same you have information that's flooded into a process and center that you can't but having worked with so many kids with disabilities in my background and issues those are usually on the extreme so with parents who are normal you know you have the crying but what it is is it degrades function so immediately that child isn't functioning as well as he could so if you ask an overwhelmed child to go pick up and do these extra things real quick example all day they've been in school, they come home, the parent asks them to do these chores. All of a sudden they have a temper tantrum because they're just upset. Well, that's overwhelmed because 
at some point it could be that that child has an issue with other information in the brain. So it's very important to understand that the brain has a capacity, a finite capacity. It's not infinite. Like we sometimes think we have an infinite capacity to, you know, have this brain power. But in reality, it's finite. Only so much information. And it's only finite because of our processing. When it, information comes in, we have a natural ability, uh, learned a little bit, but extra, you know, through our developmental experience to process that. But everyone is different. So if we become overwhelmed, people get overwhelmed at different levels. So or, if a kid you know, is overwhelmed, this kid came home, you asked him to do certain things, and they are throwing temper tantrum, what should a parent do in that moment? The best thing is really to just actually have a conversation to say, I understand why, and to slow everything down. It, basically de-escalation, but de-escalation is slowing time because really that child has done a couple things. It's over, he's overwhelmed or she is overwhelmed, but we really don't know why because we haven't, there's no assessments or anything, but it, in general, the child is fine. So really it's time. We, we want to slow everything down. We want to slow ourselves down because mm -hmm. most probably we have a million things to do. So there's the self-awareness and the awareness of the child. And once we slow everything down and then we can start to think about there's a reason for everything. That child reacted for a reason, not maybe a good one. It doesn't mean it's justified, but it's a reason nonetheless. And if we have this awareness that it's possibly overwhelmed because of their processing, then we can both work towards that in that moment. And of course, it, it goes on from there. But just as a quick de-escalation, it's really good to just stop things for a moment and just let the brain and the body, because the child's body is also now escalated, which prompts more escalation Right. And so like if the kid process. is kind of throwing temper tantrum and if the parent also starts saying, you never do that and, and, and kind of have a secondary like you know, response like that, then it would escalate too much. So the first thing you mentioned was the parent need to kind of realize that the kid is getting overwhelmed and slow things down. So the brain has the time to process whatever information it is getting bombarded with. Because the kid came home from school, has a lot of thoughts that were going on. And then as, uh, as you put on more, more thoughts or more tasks, the brain was not able to handle that. Exactly, exactly. So, so realizing that there is certain amount of emotional capacity the kid had, and then they are not able to handle more. So slow down so the brain can process. Once the brain processes, then the person would be able to either handle or, or, or perform the task that you're asking. Now, you were mentioning that it's important to kind of be prepared and write it down. So maybe then the per, then you need to kind of, when it is calm, calm down, then you can write down, okay, what happened? The kid came home, there was like already emotionally overwhelmed. There was more emotional demand. They were not able to handle. Now, how do you budget? Like, so, okay, so next time, how do you plan? You know, the, the school demands would remain and then the task demands would remain and the parent would still have million things to do. So how do you prepare for allowing this emotional budgeting that you talk about? It's structure. So just as in a budget, you're, you're not, you're not making any decisions. You're writing down the facts and in emotional budgeting, we don't equate with money or a quantified amount of relation energy. It's, by relationship so you have a mother father sister brother we don't know how many people are in your family but if you start with the mother and father and the close people closest to you it is being prepared by identifying those behaviors identifying the consequences of certain things that are attributes so attribute is a character or something that happens between the child and the mother or the child and the dad there are good ones and there are ones that the child may be annoyed. So I don't want to say there are bad attributes, but I would say that there are ones that a child or an adult thinks about that's annoying to them. 
And these are good and bad attributes, but when they're laid out for each relationship, the brain, now the unconscious part, takes this information and puts it as a structure, like a file. And by doing that, we slow down the flood when there's an event. So if something bad had happened at school, then, or uh, just a normal day of school, and they come home, when a mother begins to have that conversation again, please do your chores, this and that, the file for even for a husband and wife is not going to unroll the three years of information that that child has about not wanting to do a chore. It's going to be, it, uh, the file is already there in the unconscious mind so that it doesn't drag extraneous other issues that were also annoying or to that day. So if the child had a bad day or a good day, it doesn't roll out that into the processing so that it minimizes the information that needs to be processed in an organized way. And we call this structure. And we seek that out externally. We have church, we have Boy Scouts, we have clubs, we have all kinds of way that structures our thinking including culture, which is nonverbal cues to help structure our daily lives and not inundate our processing when we go to make a decision. So that was a lot there that I just said, but yeah. actually it's very specific to simplifying and structuring how the brain is an organ, the unconscious part, so that when we interact with it, the signals are easily reviewed or seen rather than mixed up with a lot of other stuff that may or may not be. And even in autistic people, we have lights, we have sensitivity. This information is going in the processing center, making it even harder mm -hmm. for that person to uh, mm -hmm. process. Well, this is very interesting. And, you know, I realize that we are out of time for today. So, <laughs> yeah, if people want to learn more, how can they learn more about it and how can they reach you? Quite a few places, but our site, is www.houstonbehavioralthealth.org and that spells houstonbehavioralhealth.org one word and that's our website and on there is a lot of information considering the relationship or emotional budgeting or a lot of other things but most importantly for the audience. I really appreciate taking the time to listen today because this is such a vital importance for family interplay, for uh, husband and wife, for children. It's, it's something that does help to lower and, and de-escalate and also increase our ability to problem solve. It's so important. So I appreciate everyone's listening in today. Thank you. So thank you so much. Yeah, I think there's a lot for us to learn. And as you said, like, you know, the more prepared we are, the better, better we would be able to provide this emotional regulation for both ourselves, because as parents also struggle and, and for our kids. Thank you for the gift that you're going to share with our audience. So can you tell us a little bit about what would they get if they download the gift, Unlocking the Power of Personal the power personal relationship strategy. Yes, it's just, uh, again, we're just speaking to the importance of relationships in our lives and how it's so important and how it's we're able to make sure that we're structured or remembering it in a way that comes back into our processing. When it's left unattended, uh, if you just know the revenue and you know the expenditure, when there's a problem, it creates the body reacts and the relationships it's the same way so the more we look at how important and the relationship strategy it helps us prepare us and tease out differences or importance in that strategy so it is just another way of saying i called it for some a relationship audit but actually doing the work works with the brain as an organ Wonderful. and not just as a in your as a conscious thought wonderful wonderful and i'm sure a lot of people would benefit and so if our listeners want to get this resource please go to happyandhealthymind.com friend slash resources and you'd be able to download this and all the other resources that our wonderful guests share 
on this program. So let me leave you in this note. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. You can either let life flow by and keep getting frustrated when these overwhelming emotions come up, or you may apply some of the tools that you learned today and learn more about it so that you can be better prepared and cope with emotions before they become overwhelming and enjoy better relationships and live a happier and healthier life. On that note, stay safe, happy and healthy. Until next time, Dr. Rosina. And thank you, Dr. Paul, for joining us today. Thank you so much.